Alrighty, gang, we're back. As always, you're joined by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And on this episode, we've got our massive fourth installment with the Mendocino master, old school legend, Not So Dog. Massive shout out to Not So Dog for joining us today. And as usual, we want to give a massive shout out to our incredible sponsors who help make the episodes happen. Seeds here now. You know them, you love them. They got all the hottest breeders, all the latest drops. If you're looking to get some quality genetics, look no further. With a guarantee on satisfaction and not just germination, why would you go anywhere else? If you buy seeds from them, you do a grow and you're not happy with the results at the end, hit them up. They'll square you up. I heard you can get some heavy days packs. A few of them even sold out, so get in there quick. Seeds here now, your number one seed bank. Likewise, check out our good buddies at Copet Biological Systems. If you're looking to produce a next level harvest, you simply have to keep your garden pest and pathogen free. It makes sense to periodically release beneficial predators. If you're worried about spider mites, check out the Spidex Vital. If you've got aphids, check out the Par M. These products are second to none. Copet are the world leaders in pest and predation technology. Huge shout out to our friends at Copet Biological Systems. We appreciate you so much. Thanks for helping to keep both ours and everybody's gardens running on all cylinders, pests and pathogen free. Likewise, a massive shout out to our buddies at Pulse Sensors. These guys have the latest sensor technology to ensure your garden's parameters are in check. From VPD to PPFD, all the variables you can't measure with a simple thermometer or your eyes will help you to fine tune your next crop to be superior. If you're looking for increased yield, resin, cannabinoids, terpenes, trust me guys, you've got to get yourself a pulse sensor. And they've recently released the Pulse Hub. You're going to have to pre-order that one guys, integrating all of the units together to make sure that whether you've got a single tent, a single room or a multi-state operation, your crop is going to be the best to date. Get serious, get a pulse. You've heard me talk about it guys, shout out to the newest sponsor Organics Alive truly incredible organic powdered fertilizer if you're looking for an easy solution while growing in soil they have it it is not hard to see why they are at the top of their game i highly recommend it for all the organic growers out there give it a try you will not be disappointed your plants will be next level and a massive shout out to our newest sponsors, Dynavac. They are an incredible vape company based out of USA, producing some of the most coolest engineering and vape technology you've seen for a while. I cannot speak highly enough about Dynavac's products. If you've ever had a vape and wished it was able to replicate the hit of a joint or a bong, check out Dynavac. They're second to none for good reason. We're really stoked to be working with Dynavac. Huge shout out, guys. And last but not least, a massive shout out to the Patreon gang. We love you so much. Truly the lifeblood of the show. If you're looking to get early access to upcoming episodes, if you want to hear exclusive Patreon-only content with guests the like of Mr. Bob, Bodie, Mean Gene, Tricomb Jungle, 707 Seed Bank, it goes on and on. We've also started giving away genetics on the Discord every fortnight. Come check out the Patreon, guys, www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. We really appreciate it. Much love to the Patreon gang. Huge shout out to Not So Dog for giving us so much of his time. We're very grateful. Here to talk all things history, breeding, politics, and so, so much more. So without further delay, one thing I found really interesting about what you just said there was, you know, you said that the Chem 4, you think it might have like some NL5 haze in it. And you've said that the D is probably the 91 crossed to the super skunk. So then my question becomes, what do you think the 91 is? Like, you know, we discussed in our first part that it may or may not be the puck, but I'd love to hear just even generally like, Afghani, NL, what sort of vibes do you think it'll be? Uh, well, it's a great mystery, but what I will say is that um, CSI and I have this theory that possibly the Chem 91 itself is an S1 already. <clears throat> because when we, <clears throat> he, when it, when it got S1, 
those seeds are so uniform, right? Like there's, there's, you know, there's some variance in potency and there's a little bit of variance in flavors and stuff like that, but the look and the growth pattern and all that, it's like very narrow. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, and that's, you know, that's obviously observation. It's weird in the sense that, uh, I'll bring up his name again or whatever, but, uh, cause he's just so prolific, but he's told me that basically there's almost nothing in his collection that passes on potency as consistently as the chem 91. Yeah. You know, that it, you know, it doesn't look that great. It, a lot of times it's, it's dark. It's not that frosty, you know, it has these weird leaves that likes to eat itself sometimes. And, you know, like the leaves yellow and look all funky and start dying on you and stuff, but the actual weed itself, um, you know, it really is potent. It affects most humans pretty strongly. Right. And so I, you know, I don't actually believe it's related to the puck at all. Um, I've seen, I've grown the puck. <clears throat> I've grown hybrids of the puck. Um, I know there's a rumor that it's like, you know, and some people strongly believe that it's from Oregon and that like there was this dog bud that got crossed to the puck and that's what they got. Um, again, that would be the type of thing that the puck lives, right? And so does the Chem 91. And so if we ever get genetic testing that's that specific, one would hope they'd be able to tell mother and child. But I don't see very many growth similarities or buzz similarities in it. Um, you know, at the at the first, uh, you you actually visited us the the um, at one of our uh, Can Illuminati parties that happened after Emerald Cup um, mm -hmm. at the the second year. But that first the the year before that that you weren't at, uh, you know. I had all these kinds of theories about it. And CSI was like, what if it's just an S1? What if it's just an NL leaning S1 of NL5 Haze? Mm. And I was like, fuck. And I didn't want to believe it. But um, it's that's the funny thing about it is, is there's so little known. You can almost insert your pet theory into it. And, uh, you know, because we don't know the grower. The, as far back as we can trace the Chem 91 um, are the middlemen at best. So there's nothing verifiable on what it was, really. Uh, we, we do know that it came it, that it was weed in 1991. And so you can look at, you know, uh, strains that were around back then and you can try to think of this or that or whatever. I wouldn't hazard to guess um, but to me, I've always kind of considered it as some kind of throwback ancient Afghan. Some kind of like weird Kush, you know, um, just because it was, you know, it's its effect is so indica. It is a little taller than a lot of Afghans. You know, it has some stretch to it, um, which is unusual, but uh, I wouldn't hazard to guess because, you know, uh, I was just barely starting to smoke weed back then. And I don't think we, uh, you know, I think our best hope is for genetics to prove the relationships between these things, but that won't necessarily tell us where it came from. That'll just tell us what came after. Sure. Yeah, I can agree. And just to quickly clarify, cause you sort of alluded to it, but I'd love to just get it firmly. Cause I remember I asked Skunk VA the same thing. Do you think that the chem dog does have, some amount of sativa component in its lineage. I could buy that. Yes. I could. Yeah. Very interesting. It's tall, you know, in, in, in a sense, um, it's kind of, it's kind of lanky, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's certainly not some like squat Afghan thing, like the puck or like, um, like purple Urkel or, you know, something that like grows super slow and super tight inner nodes has a certain amount of stretch to it. Um, I take it 10 weeks. So it goes, you know, um, 70 day. I know there's debate on when to take it. 
I take it upper 60s, you know, 70 days. That's when I find to be the potency to be the best mm. for me. You know, there's been people that have started taking it earlier because it tests higher earlier in terms of like THC percentage. Um, but I don't care about THC percentage. I care about my preferences, mm. you know? So, um, and it seems like when you take it 70 days, um, it likes to fall in that like 18 to 22% range. But if you take it in at 55 days, it tests at like 29%. But I think it's worse wheat. Yeah, interesting. I mean, you're a good person to ask this one to. What sort of genetics in general do you think pair really well with the chemdog style genetics? Do you think like, so for example, do you think sort of pairing it with other cushy, similar sorts of plants, do you think really radically different crosses tend to do pretty well from your experience? What do you think are good pairs? Usually, breeding in general radically different is all is usually better than very similar as a general rule um you know i've gone on record saying this a whole bunch uh i think uh chem skunk is unbelievable hybrid you know um because chem brings you know skunk tends to not be that potent really um chem brings the potency and the skunk brings aromas and it brings frost and it brings, you know, some stretch and stuff like that. So uh, I am a big proponent of crossing radically different things and seeing what comes out. Uh, I don't think that sometimes when you cross things that are too similar to one another, you don't actually get that much interesting progeny, you know, and I think that's kind of happened with cookies. Uh, where they crossed way too many of the similar things together for too long and they lost certain aspects of of quality in there and then they can't find them again. So I think the best thing for chem dog to cross to is something that you think is like got really good growth traits and is really terpy, but maybe lacks potency and you want some added heft to the bud and you want to add some potency. Um, Adding potency would be the number one reason I would cross chem dog to something. Yeah. You mentioned skunk in there as a nice counterpart. You've got a decent amount of experience with the super skunk. And I'd love to ask you, you know, how, how would you describe the super skunk? What was it like? Was it like RKS to you? Was it something different? Do you think it came from uh, the SSSC skunk stock that Skunk VA talks about when he says that the story he was told from his mentor is that it was like an F2 of some skunk stock. What do you think it is genetically and, and what was it like from your memory? Uh, well, the certainly the um, what, what it's like from the memory I'll chat about and that can just be my personal thing. Um, you know, I've, I com I've communicated a bit with, uh, uh, I guess we'll call him Skunk VA's mentor you know, uh, but he, he's kind of like a, uh, older tour rainbow hippie. And like a lot of the guys that you interview, uh, or talk to that bred in the eighties, they didn't really keep very good notes and they kind of hodgepodge things together. Um, my understanding of it, which does not negate what he said, whatever, is that, you know, um, dude had stuff from Neville and stuff from SSC that was skunk, right? Which makes sense because in the 80s, those are the, really the only two major seed banks that existed. And he crossed um, he crossed these various different things together, okay, over a number of years. And he used to call it the skunky skunk, Okay. And then I, I believe in 1990, the super skunk as a strain came out from Neville. And I think that he took his skunky skunk and crossed it to the super skunk. Okay. And I believe when some people call it the skunk six or whatever, that was the, the number six pheno of that cross. 
Now, could it have been he made that cross to the super skunk and then made F2s and then it popped out of there too? Sure. You know, um, he's light on detail when it comes to that. And I do believe that, you know, uh, skunk V8, you know, he told it a different story a long time ago. And I don't think it has anything to do with lying or anything like that. I just think it's like different pieces of information come to you at different times. Right. Um, and on top of that, the guy that made it got into some trouble uh, with some, uh, you know, some Grateful Dead type things and went on the run for a while. So it wasn't like dude was around. OK, um, when it comes to my own experiences, I'll just I'll say this. Um, it was lime green. Uh, it was fast. I would say it was done about eight weeks. OK, um, if you took it longer, it had a tendency to herm. Uh, the herms had live pollen, right? And it sometimes would herm early. So, but that makes sense, right? Because it takes four or five, you've made seeds. It takes four or five weeks after pollination for a full seed to form. So if you pull down some chem dog or you pull down some super skunk and there's tiger striped viable seed in there at 60 days, that pollination had to happen much earlier right so um the super skunk wasn't the end all be all that everybody makes it out to be um it wasn't it was moderate potency right um it grew fast it was very lime green it was very frosty it it was it was light and what i mean by that is like you could put a really big bud on a scale and you would be surprised at how little it weighed like it was, it was, I don't want to say dense. It was like well-formed, but not particularly dense. Right. You know, uh, and you know, it, uh, it didn't smell like skunk at all in veg, but as it grew, I would say probably two, three weeks before you harvested. So maybe like week six on, it was a real problem how bad it smelled. I mean, people talk about like that lost skunk terp. I remember pulling up in my driveway with my windows down and getting out of my car and being like, oh no. It was kind of like in the era before carbon filters. A lot of people actually stopped growing it because it was a bust. It was really, really hard to contain the aroma. And humans typically have a really sensitive nose to that kind of, that kind of like, funk that kind of skunk you know um and so i could not you know people talk about carbon filter killers you know this was before carbon filters but i could not contain the smell i couldn't it the last couple weeks of harvest it was like before harvest it was like oh man you know uh i would pump it into my attic i would put it through like um you know, UV generators and then have like a 30 foot run and tubing to let, let the UV try to kill it. I would blow it in my garage. I would do all these different things because it was kind of the era before carbon filters became popular. It still reeked to high heaven. It reeked like crazy. Um, and what was interesting about that is I didn't know, I didn't, nobody in my circle ever talked about terpenes or anything like that. But today I would say that the thing that made it skunky was pretty volatile in the sense that the two weeks before harvest, it reeked during harvest, it reeked. And for that first three or four weeks after you cut it, it really stank. But the older it got, the more generic green weed it became. Right. Um, and you know, it was best fresh. Like as soon as you could get it to burn, that was when it was the best. In fact, Staten Island and I, we used to grow it, you know, um, we used to grow rooms of it together and we would like the, the dog often, because it was denser, it often took three or four weeks of like drying and curing before it got like its best self. Yeah. So we would often smoke super skunk incessantly for two or three weeks until the chem dog kind of came into its own. Because we learned if we smoked the chem dog too fresh, it just wasn't as good of an experience as if we waited. 
And if you waited too long for the super skunk, it got worse. So if I used to, if I made hash from the skunk, it would actually keep in the jar. It would keep the skunk aroma for a while, but I can remember smoking a bunch of like six, seven, eight week old super skunk. And like the flavor was mostly gone and it would almost go to like generic green weed. So whatever the terpenes or whatever the theols or whatever the components that made that aroma, they were somewhat volatile and maybe they oxidized and they were, they only lasted for a period of time. In fact, when I was talking to you about, um, uh, you know, what would I breed chem dog to the whole idea of breeding chem dog and skunk together was to get the frost and the stretch and the lime green and the flavor of the skunk onto something more potent because it wasn't that potent. I bet if you, I bet if we had it today and you were testing it, it would probably come out in the mid teens. And I don't think, I don't think it would be nearly as potent as like death star or TK or sour diesel or, you know, I mean, to me, sour diesel is chem skunk at its, at its core. That to me was, was the super skunk. The super skunk was not a perfect strain. It hermed. Um, it, uh, and then obviously sometimes too, it's like when it herms, it's like back then it wasn't such a big deal, but even still, if you had little white seeds or a little immature, anything in the weed, people were going to complain. Um, a lot of people got rid of it because of how it smelled. And a lot of people got rid of it because they got tired of occasionally it herming out and throwing a bunch of live pollen on their plants and creating immature to mature seeds. Like obviously when you're trying to grow uh, seedless, getting seeds is a pain in the ass. And um, it's one of those things about preservation where now for the last 10, 15 years, people have been falling all over e each other to try to find that terp. When there was a lot of people that had that terp back in the day and chose to go in a different direction with weed than that. In fact, when I got in trouble and I lost it, um, I couldn't get anybody to help me back it up. To be fair, people wouldn't help me back it up. There you go. There you go. And look, you mentioned the sour diesel being skunk chem. And something I certainly noted myself was that when I look at those early Polaroid skunk VA took of the super skunk, that structure undeniably looks like the sour D. But I've also heard you and many other people talk about how sour D supposedly comes from the diesel too. So I'd love to hear, how does that all play together? Do you think it's like just skunk onto chem or do you think, how do you think that plays into diesel too? Well, again, um, is one of those things that genetic testing is the only real way to solve the debate. But if I had to make an educated guess not being there, I would say that uh, we'll call him Weasel. Uh, I would say that the weed that Weasel had um, was from Greg. And Greg was growing according to his conversations with Staten Island. He was growing hybrids of skunk chem that he loved. And that skunk tended to throw herms into its progeny. Right. And according to, you know, uh, swell and vondo they were buying sacks of this weed and they were collecting you know they found some seeds 12 or 15 seeds over the course of x amount of of purchases over time right and that's what they popped that became diesel one and diesel two right and then apparently it hermed and they found seeds in diesel two that lead to sour so I'm not going to sit here and, and claim, you know, uh, that I know all the steps. And again, it was young partiers and there was some different things going on. And it's a multi-stage accident. None of it was intentional. Right. Um, but, you know, when I look at sour diesel or the diesel family, I can see both parents. I can see skunk and I can see chem in it. Does that mean it's the only thing in it? I can't say that for sure. But, you know, I've grown, um, I've grown 
you know, uh, him now for, I don't know, 20 plus years, right? Easily. And uh, I grew the skunk for quite some time. Um, the sour, the original sour diesel cutting I have even does the same weird leaf rust eating itself thing that chem 91 does. And then sometimes you crack a jar of sour diesel and just reeks like skunk, mm. you know, and you see that, like you said, you see that structure. There's an undeniable similarity, right? Like if you've seen sour diesel spears and you look at some of those old Polaroids from skunk VA. It, it's not a big stretch to say that, man, that spear really kind of looks like a diesel spear. Yeah. So I'm not saying I know the complete recipe to sour diesel, but I would say that the basis of it or a large percentage of its genetics are chem skunk. I would yeah. bet money. I would bet money. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And then, so I guess the next question is, what do you think the differences are between some of the more popular sour diesel cuts? You know, so you hear about sour diesel, you hear about East Coast sour diesel, the Charco's cut, all these other ones. Do you think they're most likely just S1s of each other or do you think some of them are just like hybrids but very much leaning? And then as a final follow-up, do you think the very original sour diesel is still with us or what we have circulating nowadays is all sort of offspring? Um... Okay, well, I'll take that in chunks. I would say that this I can say for a fact is that when sour diesel, sour diesel was probably the most popular strain in America for at least 10 years. Okay, in Mendocino County and Humboldt out here, like there's a lot of strains now where there's sort of like the, de the demand might be high, but it's also shallow, right? Where in the sense with sour diesel in its heyday, if you had good sour diesel, it was basically endless the amount that you could move. And nobody cared about lineage. The I've had, I got a sour diesel cut on uh, 2000 and it came helpfully labeled sour D. I don't know anything about its history before that. But what I can say is that in that era, it basically, if it had the nose and it had the look, like, you know, it's like a, a broker would come by and they would open up the, the contractor bag of turkey bags and they would stick their nose in it and they would look up and they would be like, this is going to work. Like, they'd still look at it, but like, they, it's like if the nose hit them that strongly, it's like they knew it was going to work. So in the first wave of sour diesel, nobody cared about names. It was like there was one sour diesel cut. And it, like, if your broker liked it, that was the cut forums came into play. Like much like, you know, the dog gets called the skunk uh, VA cut because he was the first person on the forum sort of hyping it up in a way. Right. And it, like forums add names to things. Right. Um, like the Chaco cut was the cut of sour diesel that came from Chaco. The Amish cut was the cut of sour diesel that came from, from Shroomy. The res cut, you see what I'm saying? So it's like, it's almost like a tie to like, well, you know, who spread it out or who'd you get it from? And what happened is, is that no one really cared back in the day what the lineage was. Then sour diesel sort of got supplanted a, a bit by cookies and Skittles and all that. And now it's sort of had another wave in the sun in the last three or four years. And everyone's gotten incredibly interested in the oldest, realest, best diesel cut out there. But the problem is, is there's now like 15 or 20 cuts that have sour diesel attached to them. I did in 2017 or something like that. I did the sour experiment where I was like, all right, I'm going to see. I think my headband is a renamed sour or something like that, maybe. I got my sour diesel. I'm going to gather up all these sours and I'm going to grow them side by side indoor and in my greenhouses. And I'm going to figure out which ones mine are and which ones are, which ones are just the same, but different names. So I gather up eight or nine of them and I grow them all side by side and they're all fucking different. And none of them are mine. And I'm like, well, man, you know, and so there's East coast sour diesel. There's New York city diesel. There's, Chaco, there's Amish, there's um, Rez Cut, 
There's, you know, there you can go through the list. Now the, the last four or five years, there's been Albany, you know, Manny, this, that, whatever else. <clears throat> and from what I understand from what Vondo and Swell and Manny and these other guys say, I don't think there was just one cut even in the beginning. Right? Like there was diesel one and two. And then, you know, he found sour diesel in a bag of diesel two, but there was a few seeds. Right. And then Vondo took, according to Vondo, he took some of those same seeds. And when he moved West, he popped some of them in LA. Res dog did this thing, which annoys the crap out of me, which is you take a famous cut and you make seeds with it and you name your seed line, the cut. So when res dog is selling sour diesel seeds, how many of those seeds do you think got named Sour Diesel? Every one of them. Right? And then when you've got a strain that's that popular, that literally it's the most popular strain going for probably a decade, how many bag seeds on a strain that sometimes herms get found and named? And so now it's like in the last three or four years, we've been trying to like piece together what's what. And it's like a big family with obviously like a lot of different cuts involved. And people have been putting on their like Sherlock Holmes hat and trying to sort it all out. And the deeper you go, the more confusing it gets. So far, at least. And part of the problem, like one of the good things about like the chem dog story is that Greg gave the chem dog to Staten Island. He took it West. He ended up giving it to skunk VA and he gave it to, and you know, I see collective got it. And then I got it. Right. And so there's like really good provenance of this person to this person to this person. And it ties back all the way to the beginning. <clears throat> we don't really have that with sour diesel very well. So, so it's a big family with at least a dozen to 15 cuts that all have the deep, the sour diesel moniker. And 25 years later, we're trying to figure it out. And everyone's convinced that they have the oldest, realest, bestest, the right one, the real one. Ain't that the truth? And you actually must be a uh, bit of a psychic on the download because you predicted how I was strategically lining these questions up to ultimately get us to this one, which is... I want to talk about Rez. I want to talk about splitting the art from the artist. You know, I think he's a great little uh, piece to analyze for that because I think undeniably he has to be the person who's the most polarizing yet equally has, you know, some work that is really regarded by many to be quite standout. And even more impressively is that evidence has come out, you know, about how he was just breeding in a few tents and like, you know, like it all seems very unimpressive, which makes you think like maybe there was some legitimate skill involved there. What's your thoughts on the res situation in terms of separating the art from the artist? Do you have any soft spots for his work? Well, you kind of have to separate the art from the artist because I'll tell you that in researching um, we have this like running joke amongst my small group of friends when we start battling about like the eighties or nineties or something like that, which is like, which untrustworthy asshole do you put in your corner that you're going to go to bat for? Because they all have warts, right? Um, and you know, you, you look at, I, I could pick apart Sam skunk, man. You could throw darts at Neville Shanti. You know, you can, you can, I mean, there's, uh, you know, uh, Jim Ortega, you know, all these different things. And I'm not throwing it out there to like knock any of those people. I'm just saying that like humans are complicated, right? And just because you do something cool in weed doesn't mean you're not an asshole. You could be a narc, you could be a wife beater, you could be a drug addict, you could be in general, like not the greatest person and still produce cool beans that make an impact right and so um res is an interesting case in the sense that even 
like my buddy High and Lonesome will say, like even long ago on the forums before all the the, the things happened, he was kind of a jackass. You know, he wasn't the nicest homie by any means, right? And then, you know, he got supposedly, you know, one of the more famous people in weed in trouble. And he might be, there's a big debate in the community. I didn't talk about this um, when we talked about the legal scene, but there's a big debate in the community about what's narking, what's ratting, doxing, what, what ethics are acceptable, right? And there's a lot of people that do things that I consider to be ratting these days that are perfectly, that suffer no consequences, right? Rez is probably the person in the community as far as like publicly being shamed. He's like the, think of another person that got publicly shamed for ratting. He's not the only person that did it. There's a list, you know? Yeah, just to your last question, like who else has been shamed that much? It's like no one really. No one. You know, um, you know, so should should he be excluded? Uh, you know, do I think he deserves like some kind of extra special, you know, you're a scumbag? No. But I, I think there should be more people in the room with him. <laughs> <laughs> That's you a know? good answer. That is because yeah. because to me, like when it comes down to it, if you want to do something illegal and you get caught, you shut your mouth, right? And you just be quiet, and you you accept that what you did had some risk to it, and you go down. And not everyone does that, right? And there can be all kinds of nuance to it, and you can say, oh, they already knew so much about all these different people, da 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 da, da. I was just filling in some blanks, you don't know what it had been like to go away for that long or whatever, but when it comes down to it, it's like you're throwing someone else under the bus to get a better situation for yourself. And people can have whatever views they want on that. I don't approve. And I, generally speaking, don't engage with people that are willing to do that. Some of that is just self-preservation because I'm like, well, if they did it once, why would, ever, why would I ever talk to them about, you know? I mean, imagine like you hook up with someone, right? And and you find out that like she murdered her last husband. You might be like, man. <laughs> <laughs> Got to reevaluate this. <laughs> Hope that was a extenuating circumstances, you know, but it would be red. And, and so separating the artist from, from the art, you really have to do with cannabis because there's a lot of people that you could pick apart on a personal level that have done cool things in weed. Yeah. Certainly. Right. Um, and, you know, he got ostracized for a long time. And then he sort of came back. And I think he came back because the scene has expanded enough and enough time has passed that like he couldn't have ever come back in the forum era because it was too small of a group of people and he would have been hella ostracized. But even when he came back on IG, he had to turn comments off on his posts because it would just devolve into a open warfare in the, in that comment section underneath his IG posts. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's defenders of him out there. Um, you know, I don't know him personally, don't, um, but you know, it does seem like the, one of the better ways to become a good breeder is to have excellent starting stock. So, Rez working with Sour Diesel and Chem D and Chems in general. You know, I love those strains. So the likelihood that he's going to make something decent out of them is pretty high. You know, I mean, I, I'd even say that about Neville, like half of a good half of Neville's success was he got to be the first person to cross Hayes to Northern Lights. He got to be the first guy to cross Northern Lights to Skunk. He got to collect the best of a lot of these American breeders who didn't know each other and then blend those things. That's a really big component. Like, I, I, I mean, I'll, 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 I'm a Neville backer and, you know, and so I think he definitely had the eye and he was really good at seeing quality and knowing what to go for. 
but it's undoubtable that like he got skunk one, he got haze, he got G13, he got Northern Lights, he got these different things and he got to blend them first. Yeah. That matters because he started with really good genetics. And so I think res dog has really good genetics and that helps. And, um, you know, I, uh, I can understand why, I mean, he, it's funny in the sense that I know people that know him and he's not even sure what the res dog cut of sour diesel is or who named it that or where it came from. And he's got his name on it. He's not even sure how that occurred. You know? Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting perspective. And I think for me, the sort of... The thing that to me gave me, I sort of thought was like the beautiful end outcome of it all was that when I spoke to Gypsy, who did do jail time because of Rez, he had actually... He says that he made his peace with it. He said, I don't, I don't hold the guy accountable. He said, you know... Like, he, he basically says... I blame the laws in America, the insane penalties that were being imposed on people. He said, why Why would you throw your life away? It makes sense to me that you would do that. But regardless, I understand your point of view, but I thought that's that's beautiful. At least he doesn't hold him still to this day accountable, you know? I could, I could, I could say something about that. I won't get too specific, but let's just say that like, obviously like when you're involved with hippies on dead tour, you know, there was a lot of ways that weren't exactly legal that they we people did in order to stay traveling around the country without a job. You know, and sometimes people got in trouble and sometimes people went to prison over the things that they were doing. And it was really interesting. There was times that there was people that I thought were total scumbags. OK, bad people. And they got busted and they kept their mouth shut and they went away for a long time. And there was people that I loved and I thought were good people and I personally cared for a bunch. And when they got in trouble, they did whatever they had to do to get out of that trouble. And so I think it's one of those things to speak to Gypsy's point. It's very, very difficult to say what you would do if you're facing significant prison time. Right? Like without actually facing it. Everyone, of course, would like to say, I would never. But then they're like, you know, you can talk to us and you can give us this and this and this. And we already know so much about these different people. And you're not even all that important. We actually want these other folks and we already know so much about them. And if you can just fill in a few little blanks here and there, we're going to massively reduce. You'll spend a year, not 10. Right. And they're scumbags about it in the sense that they'll be like, if you have kids, if you have a lady, if you have this or that or whatever, they're going to use whatever strings they can pull on to get what they want from you, which is information. And not everyone is going to hold up in that environment. They're just not. You know, and so you can judge people. But like I said, there was people that I was like, man, if that person ever got in trouble, everybody would be doomed. And they kept their mouth shut. So it's really hard to tell until you're faced with it yourself. That's my experience, at least, you know, it's very difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, that doesn't, that's not me, me making excuses because I do feel strongly. Like I just personally, I don't, you know, like if I don't think other people should suffer for actions you are taking. So it's like, if you don't want to go to jail or you don't want to go to prison for something, then don't do it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a thing I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, like I'm from the mid, I'm from Chicago originally. When I moved out to California, there was a lot of money to be made. If I wanted to ship a bunch of California weed back to Chicago and I wouldn't do it because I was like, I would rather just grow weed in California and have it stay in California. Right. I don't want to be involved in some smuggling thing where I get in trouble and then I have to go back and do a prison sentence or whatever in Illinois and then be on probation. If somebody else wants to take that risk, that's fine. It's that's not what I am. I don't want to do that. 
right? And so sometimes people take risks because they're trying to make a lot of money or they're trying to do this or that or whatever. And it ends up, you know, if you're going to smuggle, which is kind of like when they brought down Gypsy and all that different types of stuff, if you're going to break international borders and you're going to do all that kind of stuff, they're probably going to come down on you pretty hard. Certainly. I mean, historically at that time, right, It um, the, the penalties were not lax at all. They were not lax at all. So I, I don't, it's not like I, you know, it's like there's a thing where I, I can still judge you and forgive you. Mm, interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I get it. It's always interesting to hear the range of opinions because as we said at the start, it's such an interesting case analysis. But earlier on, before we started talking about Reds and we were talking about Chem and Skunk, you mentioned the clear chain of provenance in the way the cutting had moved about. And I wanted to quickly ask you the provenance of the TK because obviously, you know, TK Origins Marty has come out and, you know... I haven't had a chance to speak to him yet, so I'm not really sure what the sitch is, but I'd love to hear. Do you think that's sort of the story you're going on as to where the TK came from? And, you know, as a loose follow-up, do you think that the TK is sort of the, quote, mother of all OGs? Uh, no and no. And the, <laughs> the, reason why, the reason why I say that is that, see, this this is the hard part too with like telling history and stuff like that is that, uh, you get people's feathers ruffled. Um, but really simple. I wasn't there. So again, I, it makes it hard for me to make definitive statements. But what I can say is that TK Origins has told three different stories about the origins of TK. And he's written them all out. You know, he told a certain version on ICMAG. And then he told a certain version to us on like our server and now he's got a certain version that he tells on Instagram, right? And they don't match up. And like he wrote all the words. So what do you do in a situation where the person's story from him typed out by him does not match up? Are we talking about like big or small discrepancies, I guess? Pretty big. So just... In a nutshell, I mean, I could, I could, after the show, I could send you, cause I have them saved. I could send you the things, but on the, when he first wrote about it on IC mag, he, he talked about, um, he was, he was young and he got hired by the guys that he was working for, um, in 1994 to go to Amsterdam and mule back seeds. And they, he went they bought five or six different strains. He listed them all out. You know, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was like Hawaiian Indica and AK-47 and, and uh, NL5 Haze, a few different ones on there. They, they came back. They had this cut called Emerald Triangle that the only thing they knew about it was it came from the Emerald Triangle. They were growing that. They had this 12 light room that was very difficult to move around in once you had it all set up. He was being paid to be the house sitter, water boy, run, run the grow for these older cats. They put in five or six of these new strains. They grew a bunch of the Emerald Triangle. And at the end of that, um, they found some seeds. That's the first version. So that's 1994, right? Um, then he came out when he talked to us on the server um, he told us that he went there in 1991 and he bought Hindu Kush directly from Neville. Okay. Um, and then now on Instagram, he talks about how he went in 1989 and he, and the guys that he was with bought Hindu Kush directly from Neville. Right. The problem that I have with that is that Neville didn't sell Hindu Kush in 1989. You can go look at his catalogs in 89 and 90. There's no Hindu Kush in there. The other thing he told me is that he turned 18 in 1990. Which means that if his bosses hired him in 1989 to go mule seeds, they were hiring a 17-year-old kid to do so. I somehow doubt that they hired a minor. Right? To smuggle seeds for them. So if I'm going to believe... Any of his. So it's basically like 
his first story was 1994. His second story was 1991. His current and most modern story is 1989. He went from, we bought five or six different seeds. I don't know what hermed or what, or what threw pollen, but it ended up seeding the Emerald Triangle to, I know specifically it was Hindu Kush, even though Hindu Kush isn't even listed on the six strains on his first story. Right? So how do, how do you parse that? Is it 1994? Is it 1991? Is it 1989? Is it the first five or six strains that he listed when he first wrote the story? Is it Hindu Kush? How did he get Hindu Kush from Neville in 1989 when Neville didn't sell anything in his catalog in 89 or 90 that was labeled Hindu Kush? And he'll say, I was there, you weren't there, bye. But he wrote out all those stories and posted them himself. So if I'm going to believe anything, I would believe the first story he told, which is that he was 22 years old or something, you know, 23. He got hired by these guys to run a room. They brought him out to Amsterdam to mule some seeds. He got, they got five or six strains. They grew them all up. It was mostly a room of Emerald Triangle. They don't know what hit the Emerald Triangle. They ended up lightly seeding the weed, but it was still valuable and it got sold. And that's where the, that's where this, that's where it got found. That I think is probably the most believable if it's true. Now, if you want to extrapolate from that, he estimates that there was 25 or 30 pounds of lightly seeded weed that they sold. I don't think that the TK and the cut that um, Matt Bubba and Josh D brought to LA are the exact same one. I have a tendency to believe that there was a few phenos that got found in this lightly seeded weed that ended up in Florida. I think I, how many, I can't say at least two, maybe three or four. Okay. And out of those three or four strains comes the, um, this is a joke, but the 34 different phenos of OG Kush that we have today. <laughs> right. You know, um, I think it's one of those things that like, you know, as people get famous, they need to come up with more detail than they had, you know? Um, and, it, and like some people might say, I'm calling him a liar or something like that. I just don't know how you take three different stories that he all typed out and posted that are from three different years and have fairly different details and it's like, okay, so if he's telling the truth, which version do you believe? Was he lying on the first story? Is he lying on the second story? Is he lying on the current story? Is it a mishmash? How do you know? It'd be one thing if it was all consistent. What if what if he had turned, just to play devil's advocate before we move on, what if he made a mistake and he didn't turn 18 in 91, but he turned 18 in 89? That that could theoretically reconcile the difference between story two and three, but not one and then the others, I guess. Not not the first story that he posted that as the real tri tip or whatever on IC Mag where he says nineteen ninety four, and not the list of strains that he gave that doesn't include Hindu Kush. Sure. The other problem is that he says he got it from Neville, and I mean, I can, you can, I'm sure you have them, but if you don't, like, there is nothing in Neville's catalog in 1989 or 1990 that says Hindu Kush. I guess, you know, that, that's really interesting to hear that perspective, and that's good, because I'd heard there were discrepancies, but I never knew what they were specifically. But my follow-up question is, do you think that it was, in fact, Hindu Kush to whatever this Emerald Mountain strain is? Or do you think the lineage might be something... Because I think somewhere someone said, oh, Emerald Triangle, that was a sort of Hindu-y, Kushy type plant. I mean, he said, he said that they called it Kush because of the, you know, they, you know, the Emerald Triangle. So it might not have been a Kush at all. You know, Emerald Triangle could, uh, you know, but I don't know. I wasn't there. That I, I can't. All I know is that he wrote multiple stories that don't seem to add up. We know that from we know that the TK came from Florida. 
We know that the cut that Josh D and Matt Bubba brought out from Florida to LA in 1996 or whatever came from Florida. We have pictures of that weed. Yeah. Uh, and it obviously like sour diesel, Kush became extremely valuable and extremely sought after. And it went from one or two or three cuts to several dozen. Yeah, sure. And people had an intention to, you know, muddy the waters a little bit. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, like I'm not throwing it out there or whatever, but I mean, I think that there, for a while people thought in California, Swamp Boy Seeds, you know, uh, Ricky and Chrome and those guys were the guys that like they were the TK guys. Mm -hmm. Like they were the people that sprouted it. They were responsible for it. Yeah, I've heard that. And then it kind of came out that they just got it early. Certainly. Look, it sounds like it's one of those ones where we'll have to wait and see. And as you've said a few times to a few questions, you know, I'm sure at one point genetic testing will help yield some answers. But well, you're you're also asking a bunch of questions about uh, a bunch of weed strains that originate in the early to mid 90s at a time when prohibition was high and information and the Internet didn't exist. And a lot of this information is percolated out very slowly. Yeah. Long after the the initial events occurred. Yeah. I mean, that that fucking uh that dude from Hawaii, I don't even like saying his name, but that dude from Hawaii will tell you that it all originates from Crippy. That that, you know, that the that the surfers brought it out and it's actually Hawaiian originated from Neville, but Hawaiian, and then it went to Florida. And then the guy, Alec, I mean, it's one of those things where you start pulling on it and it's like there's unknowns. And how do you resolve those unknowns? True. Well, look, let's, you know, we've been going for basically three hours now. Let's do some more fleshed out light and fun ones before we wrap up. And I've, I've written some special ones that sure. I think I think we'll still be able to have a good little chat about them. But there's some interesting ones. And so the first one I want to throw by you is... Did you ever get to try the Francine strain from Staten Island that Skunk VA spoke about? Or was that gone by the time you met him? It was gone. I didn't try it, but that that is the reason why Staten got um got the skunk at least. Mm. Um and uh Staten got rid of it because it had horrific mold. Okay. It had really, really bad mold problems. Um, and you know, obviously like, I don't know if you ever had this happen to you, but if you've ever had a crop, you harvest a crop and you realize that it's riddled with mold, it's very depressing. Mm. Um, and so he dropped it in favor of, uh, other strains. He did have a very nice glass piece by, um, um, by Bob that he, uh, uh, only had smoked the Francine out of. Huh. And he never ever smoked any weed again out of it. So it was just kind of like this like museum piece or whatever. Um, but unfortunately, it, you know, there was a huge fire in the 17 fires, his house burned down, and uh he lost all that glass then. But um, yeah, I, I was, you know, I don't I don't really I don't really like to tell this part of it, so I won't, but I will just say that Skunk VA and Staten Island were best friends. Um they had a falling out and then I ended up sort of being for that next, that next period, sort of like Staten's best friend. Um, so uh, Skunk VA and him were friends before I knew him. Um, and that's when he grew the Francine. By the time that I met him, he had replaced it with the skunk and the chem and it wasn't, he wasn't growing it anymore. So I never saw it or smoked it. Yeah, nice, interesting. Okay, and then similarly, would you have any interest in growing out either, say, the purest indica? Because I know that that you know that seems pretty interesting. Or on the other hand, once Tom's finished, any of Tom's haze, either of those strike you as interesting? Uh, Tom's haze certainly. Yeah, I haze is. Uh, I I love haze very much. It's uh, it's very difficult to find a good one. Uh, part of the part of the problem with haze is that it takes forever and that only about uh, five or 10 percent of them are really super nice. So you have to go through a lot of mids and a lot of garbage to find the 
exceptional ones, but I would definitely lean much more towards that because I do think the provenance of him getting it. I believe him that he went there in 1994 from Positronics and got it. I believe that he's like repro open pollinated it a few different times. Um, I went to I went to his I went to his house not that long ago and uh, saw the little project he had going on. So I would be I would be definitely interested in in that. The purest indica. I don't know how I feel about that one really, um, for a variety of reasons. But uh, I I think um, in general, I think that we have. If you want to talk about chems and cushions and the, I think we have a lot of really really exceptional Afghanis to choose from, and I think we have less sativas to choose from than Afghanis. So if I had to choose which one at this point in my life I'm more interested in, it would be sativas. Simply because we already have such a big blessing of indicas that are available and out there. Yeah, true. That's a really nice answer. I like that. So we've been talking about, you know, NL5, Hayes and Neville. I now want to ask you if you could ask Neville any two questions, what two questions would you want to ask Neville? Oh man. Huh. That is a good one. Um I've been blessed in that I get to talk to some of Neville's old friends still that helped him with a lot of projects. So in recent years I've been able to get a lot more in depth with uh, a lot of the questions that I had as best as could be answered. Um, I met Neville several times in in Holland, but I was young and and starstruck. And I, I I would love to say that I had some like deep penetrating conversation with him, uh, but I did not. You know, I did not have any kind of deep or or involved combo with him. In the few times that I was in the same room with him, um, he's significantly older than me. You know, and I was a dumb kid, um, but. I, uh, if I had to ask him, I would probably ask him and I kind of know this already, but I would kind of ask him, um, what of the things that he lost, did he still think were most current, like were the things that he regretted the most and, you know, and why, you know, because you know, for instance, if you read a bunch of his posts out of all the seeds he got from Sam Skunk Man, um, he only got about seven or eight of those hazes to pop. And by 1991, he only had one left because they were long flowering and a huge pain in the ass. And he didn't realize there was anything special about them until he'd made a few mistakes. So he never actually got like almost all. I think all of the commercially available seed stock was all from Hayes C, you know, but there, um, there was one year that he released Hayes B, but he never really got a chance once he knew what he had to play around with them. So I guess my second question would be if you had all seven hazes that you popped, what directions, which ones would you cross and why, and where would you want to go with them? Brilliant. I love that. Pondering thoughts for us all. I definitely would be interested to hear what his answers are. And now I want to remix it. Same question. You get to ask two questions to Sam the Skunk Man. What are you going to ask Sam? Would he would would he be would he have to be honest with me? He he has to be honest with you. Uh what Afghan did he use in Skunk One? And when he was making Skunk One. Is the Mexican Colombian part of it Pollyanna from Rob Clark? Uh huh. That's beautiful thoughts there. That's what I would ask him if he had to be honest. Do you believe that the Colombian that was used in Skunk is the same one that was used in Hayes, as the internet stories say? You know, I don't know. Um, part of the problem with the Hayes story is that. Until it gets to Europe, there's only really one guy telling it. You know, supposedly there's a Hayes brother or two that's alive, but they've never decided to come out there and talk publicly. So you only have Sam. And I can tell you from the forum days, 
He has been defending everything he says is the absolute truth for 25 plus years vigorously. Uh, on Cannabis World, he used to go by the handle Know It All for Sure. <laughs> and he would fight people like intensely on all this different stuff. And, you know, um, there's a big debate whether, like, you know, there's no doubt his impact on things. But, like, the other part of it is that the one other guy that was around a bunch was Rob Clark and their best friends. And he won't refute anything that Rob says or that, that Sam says. So it's really hard to get, um, you know, like if you do, if you do a study and you get a result, you hope somebody else can get the same result. Yeah, it would be, it would be. And that's kind of like the scientific method or whatever is like, can different people do the same experiment and get similar results? I would love if there was five or six different people that were all talking about the skunk and the haze in that era and were willing to put what they remember down on paper because what we basically have is Sam's version. And so how do you battle that? Uh, I know that that Rob was working with a bunch of Mexicans and Colombians. Me and a few friends have a sneaking suspicion that the that the um the the uh sativa side of skunk one is from rob's work yeah but it's hard to say i mean i'll tell you do you remember how you know matt and i did those interviews with mad jag oh, don't go there i was this is my next question <laughs> no go for it yeah of course they're incredible well I, I will say that like when he got all those skunks in 1978 it was rob who delivered them all to him too true. And that was, you, you're such a mind reader because I was about to say, you know, having done those incredible episodes with Mad Jag, how has your perspective changed on Rob Clark? I have always had a high opinion of Rob Clark. One of the first three books I bought to teach myself how to, how to, anything about weed was Marijuana Botany. Um, it's a little bit simple these days, but for some, for in an era where there was almost no, verifiable information about how the cannabis plant worked to have Rob come out with a very simple primer laying out how to breed and how it worked and what it did. Um, he was invaluable to me in teaching a lot of basics about cannabis, you know? Uh, and it seems like, you know, he did a lot of work. It's, he's kind of quiet about it. I think if I had to guess, I would say he lets, Sam shine with some of his work and doesn't care about it that much in terms of like who gets the credit, but that would be for him to say. Um, I do think it's interesting, like speaking of Mad Jag or whatever, that Sam always insists that his seed company was him and only him and nobody else was involved but him. But then when Mad Jag bought like a ridiculous amount of seeds in 1978, it was Rob who flew them out and gave them all to him. You know, do you not f think that it's interesting? Because what I took away from that moment when I heard that was these guys must have felt like they were still small fry for Rob to have delivered that order in person for what was what was like three or five grand or something. It was five grand in 1978. It was the biggest purchase of seeds that they had ever done at that point. Right. And but it, but it's still still small fry in the scheme of things, right? So I I thought to myself, they must have been really giddy, like wow, there's a big sale for us, considering they would hand delivered it. Yeah, and and Majag still has the original packaging they came in. Mm. He does, so that's pretty crazy. And he's got you know real experience and like what they were like back then and all that. And you know he said Rob had a, just an incredible collection of killer weed. Um, when he, when he, when he got hand delivered the seeds or whatever, um, you know, I, I think this is indisputable, although Sam won't like it, but I think when Sam went to Holland, he gathered up a bunch of seeds from people he knew and brought them out there. Hayes skunk. He got the Durban poison and the Afghani one from Mel Frank. You know, um, so it wasn't all just his work. I think some of it was Rob's work. Some of it was Mel Frank's work. Some of it was his work. 
some of it was the Hayes people's work. Cause even he admits that it's like, you know, um, he didn't do the haze. It was like, he got seeds of it, you know? Mm. And, uh, you know, but there's inconsistencies in his story too. He'll swear that it was, he was never busted. And then I've watched videos of Mel Frank saying, Oh, well, he went to Holland after his second bust, <laughs> you know? So some of these things are like old timers covering for each other, mm. you know, but you got to realize the era that they were in too. Uh, and most of it, I will say, for anybody that is listening to me, um, my experience with seed breeding is whoever gets famous, there's a small group of friends or associates around them that helped at various stages that don't get the credit. Sure. I do not believe that Sam was like alone with no helpers, with no partners, with no buddies contributing, that he was doing it all himself, that every strain he used was original to him and no one else ever had it. Can I prove it wrong? No, but you know, I, uh, um, I also think that from what Neville said and from what Carell from SSSC and some of these other guys said is that the skunk that he brought over at first was much different than after he had done some open pollinations and his own line breeding in Amsterdam. And, you know, he bred it in a way that they didn't prefer. So, but Rob, Rob is one of the more important people in cannabis in his era. He wrote, a, he wrote some lasting books. Um, he, he got some information out there. I definitely think he did a lot of underground breeding and I think he's responsible for more than he wants to admit. So would I wish that he would just come out and say it all? Sure. But despite that, he still did it and we still benefit from it. So huge kudos to Rob. The, the next question I have for you is that photo of Neville in the hash den in Afghanistan. I think it's got to be the most iconic cannabis photo of all time. Do you agree or disagree? It's pretty iconic. Um, you know, I think Neville gets a lot of credit in the sense because he was first. Um, he certainly suffered more than most seed breeders being first and struggled a lot more. Um, you know, he got bitter in the end because people, you know, stole so much stuff from him. But it's actually kind of interesting in that regard of, I don't know if he's told this story, so it's not like it's secret. And he, and he wrote it on Mr. Nice, but do you know what he had to do to prove he wasn't a DEA agent? Didn't you have to like shoot heroin in front of him or something? Yeah. Because they figured no DEA agent would do that. And it just turns out that he was a heroin addict. So he could do that without dying, but his photographer Clyde, OD'd over there and almost died. Jesus. Um, so it was very sketchy. I mean, he went over there and dealt with the Mujahideen, you know, when the Soviets were, you know, were right in the middle of their big Afghanistan war. There was a lot of stuff going on over there, you know, and um, it is pretty interesting to think that if you like weren't a heroin addict, you probably would have either had to refuse and maybe been killed by the Mujahideen or you would have done it and OD'd and died because you didn't have a tolerance because you weren't a heroin addict. Huh. Right place, right time. It's funny how life works sometimes. Interesting stuff. I'm sure everyone's keen to hear more about that and maybe at some point we'll hear more. I have this opinion. I've held it for a while. I think I might have even said it once or twice. I think Sub calls Space Queen male, the male he calls Space Dude, I think that is maybe the best male we have access to like it's still around it's it's empirical evidence it produces nice crosses i think it may be the best male that we have what comes to mind when i say that and agree slash disagree uh well i will say that uh with the reversals revolution males are few and far between i'll also say that males um typically get traded much much less than females so there really isn't like a collection of elites in terms of males that get passed around right um so males are sort of like the 
the secret sauce, if you were. And, um, you know, I, uh, I would say, and I, I've been trying to figure out if it exists for forever. To me, the most impactful male in cannabis is probably the haze sea male. Yeah. And I hear rumors that it's alive and I hear rumors that it's not, you know, but as far as like an impactful, it doesn't mean we can get our hands on it, but as far as an impactful male, that's like made a bunch of hybrids that have gone on to be like crazy, um, you know, uh, just influential in the scene. That is probably the primo male that's existed. Um, but I don't have any experience with his space. I mean, that male really. So I can't really comment on how good it is or not. But I will say that before all this reversal stuff existed, um, male, Matt likes to call it the shotgun method. But really, there's there's no way to test to see if a male actually does what you want unless you grow out its progeny which is very time consuming, obviously, because you have to like make seeds and then grow them out and then see. And so when people find males back in the day, it used to be that all those seed companies, the males were the backbone and the most important part of their breeding process. They were hoarded incredibly because once you found a male that passed along desirable traits that you were looking for, it took so much time and effort to figure that out that you typically held on to it and never passed it around, which means no one else ever got to experience it. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but that's about as close as I can come. No, that's good. And it's a, it's a very interesting point that, you know, with the advent of how popular reversals are, does it even, is it even really that relevant anymore? Which is, I can certainly understand that. So on to the second last question for our part two, Will people ever be able to buy your seeds? Probably. Um, I have, uh, it's kind of a running joke in the crew, right? Where I haven't commercially said yes yet because, you know, I watch what all my friends go through when they sell seeds and it just looks so attractive. Getting people calling you a hack or a chucker, you know, or a herm breeder or a fake or this or that. And it's sort of like, um, you know, it's really hard to accuse you of being a, a, a money grubbing scumbag when you're not making any money off it, you know? Mm. <laughs> so, and then the other part of it too, is that all the breeding that I've ever done has been for me and to try to breed weed that I liked and to create weed for my friends that we liked. I never actually, and by doing that, it's incredibly freeing because you literally don't have to care what the public thinks. So once you're in a commercial seed situation, you kind of have to try to make things that you think people will like. Yeah. If you want to make money off it, if, if you're fine with just making what you like and if it bombs, it bombs, you know, but in the way seeds are now, anytime, if I made, if I made seeds and I passed them out, there would be a bunch of people that would, there would be not a bunch, but there would be some people that would be like, oh, he's been building this, um, you know, this group for a while just to like have a market to sell his seeds. Oh, we knew this was coming, you know, or then people grow them out and they're not what they want or they herm or they this or that. And it just goes to show that I'm like, I'm a shitty breeder or whatever. Uh, so with all that being said, I do think I'm going to release some seed um, probably before the end of this year. And it is going to be stuff that interests me and hopefully people like it. And if they don't, they don't. Mm, I like that. I like that. We'll all wait and see what comes. I'm sure it'll be very exciting. It could also fail too. I mean, it's actually like in, it's actually in progress right now, but we'll see. It's going to, I'm going to try to do some, I'm going to try to do some reversals, you know, and if it works out, uh, you'll know about it. And I don't want to reveal too much. I'll I'll leave the finer details for you to really uh, reveal in due time. But I would love to know what what are you reversing at least? Uh, well, I'll say this: um, 
there are a, there are a number of projects that I have going, and I kind of balance them between my own interests and then things that I don't think are generally speaking out there in the public, right? Because even though I've held Chem 91 forever, there's a lot of people doing reasonably, you know, doing some pretty good breeding work with it. There's no like shortage, you know, of, of Chem 91 beans out there, right? So if you're going to make an impact or something like that in this in the seed world, you might as well bring out things that are not very circulated. So at least you're adding some new wrinkle or some new genetics to the larger pool that's out there. So that, in a sense, um, you know, uh, is a big driver because if you're going to do it, you might as well try to like break some new ground or whatever. Um, so there's some things that could be in the works in terms of like that, uh, that headband cut that I call the LA because I don't think it's very well circulated and it's one of my favorites. Um, that, that definitely is going to be something, um, my Maui cut that I have, um, also not particularly well circulated. So, and I have some really cool ideas with it, uh, possibly the flow rider OG cut that I have, which is also not very well circulated, but it's in cookies. Um, and so it's a combination of something that's rare that people could, you know, maybe take in a different direction, but then also something that, to be fair, commercially, something that I think people would be um, interested in. You know, I had friends talk me out of, you know, it's not like I'm going to do like some Bodhi thing right off the bat and like release like extreme sativas that are a huge pain <laughs> in the ass and, uh, you know, would take forever and would, you know, you're trying to you're trying to like balance what would people be interested in? What would be something new? What would be a different wrinkle? You know, and to me, it's it's um, it would be a cool way to get genetics out there that uh, aren't that spread. With the L.A., it's a little bit cheating in the sense that I gave it to CSI and he released L.A. by TK and L.A. by Chem D, which got like very warmly received. And a lot of people found winners in that. And so it sparked some interest. So it leads me to believe that perhaps. Um, that could be both fun for me and commercially viable, you know? So, uh, and then I'll say this, and this might get me into some trouble or whatever, but uh, it turns out that there's a lot more chem D's out there than people think. And um, that opens up some room maybe for, I might do some chem D work, not only because I love it and I think it's super potent, but also because I think there's four or five cuts out there um, at least that go by the moniker of Chem D and even some ones that people are absolutely sure is, is the one might not be the one that I have. Doesn't mean mine's special or whatever. I'm just saying that like it kind of fits into that, like get something a little different out there. Um, and then, you know, those things, if those things actually work, they would probably get crossed to a bunch of things that are I hold in my collection that I think would be interesting. You know, some sativas, some Afghans, some purples, some this, some that, some different things. It probably would be very old school grouping of cuts because that's kind of where my collection leans. I don't have a whole bunch of new Zaza. So you're not going to see a list of uh, of things that are wildly popular in the last four or five years. It would probably be blends of classics. You know, I mean, yeah. my whole breeding career, I basically just like made seeds for me and friends and given them away. So the whole idea of like starting a seed company is a little odd. Um, but, uh, you know, I have so many good friends bug me about it um, that uh, it might be time. So we'll see. Here, here. That's exciting stuff. So. On to the final question for this interview. It's sort of a two-parter, but I'd love to hear it. You're going to theoretically start a company from scratch. You've lost everything you've got. You're starting fresh. You can pick one pack of seeds to presumably find a male from that and then start the company with that. Here's the two-parter to it. One possible outcome is you're going to do it and it's what's available today. It has to be something that's currently commercially available. 
And then the part B is you could sort of do the time machine thing where you could pick a pack from throughout time, you know, and choose it. So what would your two options be in each scenario? Well, um, boy. So if we're talking about one pack of seeds from today, you got to realize that because you said I would, you'd get a male to start it. That eliminates probably 95% of the current market because we've been doing reversals now for a good 15 years. So the amount of people that are releasing regular seeds is very small. Well, let's let's jazz it up. You could you can equally you can get a pack of CSI, you know, ChemD cross headband and get a female and reverse it. That's also cool. You just it just has to be one pack. One pack. Um, well, I would say if I can, if I can pick all females and reverse it, I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to say, I would get a pack of LAD from CSI simply because those are two of my all time favorite strains that I would have lost. And I would like to hunt through those both to refine leaners that of the things that I lost. And I also think that it's just incredibly fireweed, both of them. So the chances that you would have good things. And then um, if if we're talking regular seed, right? Um, this might sound nuts, but I would probably, if I can get some shit from, I would probably try to get some of that uh, OP uh, haze that uh, Tom is working on. If we're going actual like regular males, and stuff like that, you know, um, because that that ties back to way, way, way back, you know, and there's a lot of diversity in there and you could take that and you could cross it to a lot of modern indicas and a lot of different new, new, new. And it's so different that you could get some cool stuff, perhaps. And then if I could go back in time. Boy. If I could go back in time. I'll cheat a little bit and and say something that most people probably won't think of. Um, but I would probably go back and try to get early Pearl. And the reason I say that is because one of Neville's oldest friends that I chat with told me that the last five, six years of Neville's life, he was crossing a bunch of Mexicans together. Because out of all the stuff that he had, one of the things that he was really hunting to find, he'd done a bunch of haze work in Australia with the the um, the outback, you know, and all that type of stuff. But he was really looking for this certain sweetness and the certain buzz that he got from those Mexicans that came from the early Pearl. And so I figure um, if he loved it that much that out of everything he ran through as he aged, he really wanted to refine that. Uh, maybe going back in time into the late 80s and getting some early pearl when it was still legit before it got lost would be that would be something cool. That's beautiful. Really cool to hear. I wouldn't have thought of that. That's a I'm gonna have to dig more into the early pearl. Obviously, I tried a little sample of Pip's uh silver pearl and it was beautiful, so I can only imagine the early pearl equally special. I think uh with that being said, we're just about at the end of it for this one. Did you have any general comments or shout outs you'd like to make? Um, comments, sure. I say this a lot, but I'll say it again. Is uh, grow weed that you love. Uh, if you're breeding, try to find two plants that you like qualities of each and you hope maybe you can get those qualities in th the progeny itself. So therefore, like, don't breed for what you think other people will like. Breed for what you think you would personally like. That's the best way to do breeding is to look for things that you enjoy. And when it comes to preservation, nobody can preserve everything. But if you can hold on to one or two or three things during this storm that's going on right now, if you can find some old things that really speak to you and you really love, um, you can't hold everything, but even holding on to one or two or three old, maybe even currently unpopular things, but really, really do it for you. Um, that can help preserve it for better times ahead. 
you know, and then beyond that, thanks to all the weed nerds and everyone else that like listens to my homie show all the time. And I appreciate uh, there being enough interest for him having me back and listening to me babble for hours on end. So that's always good. And, um, you know, uh, we will uh, if, you know, if I do decide to release seeds to the public or whatever, I'll certainly like pass it out through him and the various things. And, you know, a small core group of enthusiasts can keep something cool going. So even though you're out in the middle of nowhere, or even though you feel isolated, even though it's something, if enough of us work towards the same goal, um, we can kind of keep the fire burning uh, through some tough times. And that's that. A truly beautiful and inspiring sentiment. And I think I speak for us all when I say we're very excited for the idea of an upcoming seed release. We'll have to wait with bated breath. Again, a huge thank you for part two, the originator of Mendo Perps, one half of the incredible Breeders Syndicate. A huge thank you again, Not So Dog, for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, dude. I really like chatting, so it makes it easy. And there you have it, gang. A huge shout out to Not So Dog for taking the time to come by, not once, but twice, and share some of his cannabis lore cannabis knowledge and some cool tidbits from the past if you like this episode please go check out our patreon the only way to get early access to content www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast our patreon supporters have had access to this episode for a while now be sure to check it out if you want to hear more content before it goes live for the general public Likewise, we would love for you to go and support our sponsors. By supporting them, you help them to support us. Seeds here now. Best seed bank in the industry. Whatever drop you're looking for, they're going to have the latest and greatest from all the best breeders, people who I vouch for as well. A guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. Please go check them out. Seeds here now, your number one seed bank. Just like I want you to go check out Copa Biological Systems. These guys have the best predators in the game. I cannot stress this enough. If you want to keep aphids and spider mites out of your garden, please get the Apiparem and Spidex Vitals. I hammer on about these products because they're so bloody good. Thank you so much, Copet, for supporting the show. We are such big fans of your products and truly grateful to have you supporting us. Likewise, a huge thank you to the ongoing support we get from Pulse Sensors. These guys have the best units in the game. I run them in my garden. There's absolutely no doubt it's helped improve the quality of my crops. And with the release of the recent Pulse Hub, there's no reason not to get on board, get excited and get yourself a Pulse. As I say, from a single tent to a single room to a multi-state operation, get serious, get a Pulse. You've heard me talk about it, guys. Shout out to the newest sponsor, Organics Alive. Truly incredible organic powdered fertilizer. If you're looking for an easy solution while growing in soil, they have it. It is not hard to see why they are at the top of their game. I highly recommend it for all the organic growers out there. Give it a try. You will not be disappointed. Your plants will be next level. Massive shout out again. And a massive shout out to our newest sponsors, Dynavap. They are an incredible vape company based out of USA, producing some of the most coolest engineering and vape technology you've seen for a while. I cannot speak highly enough about Dynavap's products. If you've ever had a vape and wished it was able to replicate the hit of a joint or a bong, check out Dynavap. They're second to none for good reason. We're really stoked to be working with Dynavap. Huge shout out, guys. And that just about does it for this one, my friends. Thank you for making it to the end, as always. Much love from your boy, Heavy Days, signing off from the Upside Down Library. I'll see you for the next one. See you.